company of makers. Podcast Talks Workshops. This series is dedicated to those who served in Optelic and their families, marking the 20th anniversary of the commencement of operations. Each episode, we'll talk to members of the armed forces community who served in Optelic, or whose lives have been directly impacted. These are true life accounts, and these personal stories may be emotionally challenging to hear. If you feel you may be sensitive to this, you may prefer not to listen. Hello and welcome to Land, Sea and Air. I'm Steve, co-founder of Company Makers. And I'm Tip Cullen, an actor and former Royal Marines commander. And on this episode, we have Neville Johnson, who served in the British Army in um, Iraq in, on Optelic. And he's also a published now poet. Yeah, and he's also a Commonwealth soldier. So he joined, uh, left South Africa and joined the British Army, which is, you know, He's one of a, a number of incredibly good people that are in the armed forces. Indeed. Let's have a listen to what he's got to say. Neville, thank you so much for agreeing to come on the podcast. And it's four o'clock or about to be four o'clock in the morning where you are. You're a South African in New Zealand who served in the British Army. I think that requires a bit of explanation, if you don't mind. Uh, that is correct. That is correct, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, to make a long story somewhat shorter, born and raised in South Africa, um, I left the country, was in 2000, went over to the UK, and um, it was the usual ticket to off, um, working in, and traveling, uh, working in various places, working as a barman, working in factories, and just basically exploring and traveling the, the country. And it wasn't until 2003, <laughs> that I decided to um, to go and join the British Army. That sounds and, like and, perfect timing, <laughs> given what we're about to talk about. Yeah, correct. It was actually it was, and um, it was at the back end of two thousand and three that I, I decided to walk into the recruiting office in Strand in London, and um, that's where everything began for me. Um, done a couple of days uh, selection. I think it was in Purbright. Uh, past that. And then um, got accepted into uh, the basic training. Um, and that was that that ran over the back end of 2003, in the beginning of 2004. That was six months up at um, up north, I think it's North Yorkshire in, mm -hmm. in Catrick, yeah. uh, the, the big sort of um, training area. Yes, yeah, so I spent a, um, a good sort of six months there, uh, past that, and got stationed in. Um, Belfast, Northern Ireland. That's where I joined my uh, my units, uh, which is the uh, or was the Second Battalion, Royal Regiment of Fusiliers. So, did you know much about Northern Ireland? Um, I before? knew nothing, <laughs> nothing whatsoever. I had no prior knowledge of the place. I knew there was a country called Northern Ireland or Ireland. You know, I knew of uh, a name Belfast, but otherwise nothing else. Um, Hindsight, I think I should have looked into it. I should have done my homework, but um, I didn't. Um, yeah, and, but that those first couple of weeks, yeah, it was a big, big eye opener for me um, mm. to actually go in an area like that, you know, and and, and doing patrols, um, doing exercises, and 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 the relentless training that we uh, received. Yeah, it was a big eye opener. Uh, that uh, that paved the way for um, I think. Uh, for future operations, and when when um, I then in the following years in two thousand and five and two thousand and six when I deployed to uh, Iraq with a uh, with my unit. So as you know, that's that's what we're here to talk about. So did your time in Northern Ireland help? I don't know how. I think when we spoke earlier, you said you were twenty six when you joined up. Yeah, I was twenty six. I was the oldest in my intake, um, much much older than than the rest. Um, but I thought. Okay, I'm not going to let that bother me. You know, uh, that's what I wanted, and uh, and I went for it. Yeah, um, yeah. So I was 26. I think the age, the older age, helped somewhat, and the training, and and, and the tempo of um, of our sort of operations definitely helped a lot. 
um, during nor- Northern Ireland um, for our operations in Iraq, you know, with policing, right control, uh, public order, yeah, um, vehicle patrols, foot patrols, um, helicopter patrols. That definitely paved the way for for the operations in um, during 2005 when we went over to um, Basra. Um, that definitely helped a lot. Obviously, the weather was different, the culture different. Uh, the heat was a it was a smack in the face, but um, that definitely helped a lot. So, what were your responsibilities? What what happened in Basra when you were there? Um, basically, uh, working with various other units, uh, um, vehicle patrols, foot patrols, um, Eagle VCPs, uh, working with with various other units, conducting patrols within Basra and operations, um, either daytime, nighttime. Um, it was it was uh, it was a good pace, but I think ultimately in the end it was uh, I think it was big anti climax for for many troops for for, for many lads because you know um, the lads it was the big build up for that was was great you know that the, the training um, the exercises knowing that we're going to deploy to to bus rifle operations you know and I think a lot of lads thought it might be. Um, where we're we going to get stuck in with the enemy, where we're going to get into contacts, you know, because various other units got into contacts with um, with the, the local militia groups there. Um, I think especially up, it was north, I think, in Alamara, we've seen footage of units getting attacked, their bases, you know, small arms fire. So we thought that it was going to be the same, you know, and... Um, when we got there, it was somewhat different. You know, it was it was long hours, um, many hours doing vehicle patrols, foot patrols in the heat, um, and yeah, it was somewhat different. Um, although, yeah, we, we there was you know the the art, well not art, but the yeah the indirect fire on the on the um, on our base, mortar fire, and it was also the start of the uh, roadside bombs that we got introduced to. That unfortunately. Um, the unit uh, lost um, two lads, and I think a further two lads got seriously injured as well. What impact does that have when that happens? Um, I think it depends on the person. Um, everyone, I think, dealt with it in their own way. Um, initially, it was it was a big shock, but everyone, you know, we were trained just to get on with it, get on with the job. Uh, but I think the team they got hit. Um, I think that that had a, a, a quite a big impact on them, you know. And, and following years later, because I remember years later when we eventually moved to Cyprus, um, because the the role of the unit was to move every two years, you know. Prior to when I joined the unit, they were based in Germany. I joined them; they were in um, Northern Ireland. And it's funny enough because when we um, left Belfast, it was classed as a residential tour. But then we left that to go on another operational tour to to Iraq. And when we got back, or when that tour finished, we went to um, Cyprus. It wasn't until much later that I met up with one of the lads. They got injured when their um, vehicle got struck with an IED. He lost his, his leg from the knee down. And he was a big um, Fijian lad. We used to play rugby together. And I think that's where it struck me in the fact that um, just just the the sheer devastation um you know um it's got on on the people and and the teams there but i think at the time we just cracked on with it you know mm. um because there was a, there was a job to do and it was expected just to crack on with it you know so how long was that first tour six months and was that largely for you personally incident free um yes um despite um though because the, the the team they got hit with the roadside bombs, they got hit twice. It's the same team they got hit twice. Uh, so it was the roadside bombs or the IEDs, and then the indirect fire. So every so often they would attempt to you know um, try to hit the base. They were horrendous. Their aim were either too short or it would go over. But um, just this, the feeling, you know, knowing that someone is out there to to attack you. Uh, the, the incoming rounds, the sound, um, just the feeling is difficult to explain. Um, the the fear, um, 
it's horrible, you know, the fact that you're not there on holiday, you're there to mm -hmm. conduct operations, you know, yeah, you're given orders, you expect to follow them, you know, and everyone trained together, you know, um, and, you know, we went through together, you know, um, an amazing experience, that's for sure. But uh, you're always on alert, you're always, you're never really fully relaxed. And, and, and I think that's, um, that never helped, you know, long term, you know, health wise, you know, but you know, we're all just cracked on with a job. I guess that's the nature of a counterinsurgency, isn't it? Rather than having a, you know, an enemy in uniform who are in a specific location that you're, you know, going into contact with. Yeah, correct. Exactly. Yeah. Very key. So you left there for Cyprus and you went back to, you were redeployed back to Iraq. Yeah, um, those uh, the seven. I always say the seven short years. They felt like twenty years, but the, the seven years that I that I served in the um, in the Fusiliers, it was that the, the, the op tempo was was um, was quite high. Um, there were always various units, various teams, companies, battalions. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I mean, companies. Yeah, that deployed somewhere, either Iraq or Afghan. But um, yeah, it was a big tempo. And um, so the first tour, it was, it was, yeah, the residential tour in Northern Ireland, you know, that was in um, 2004 that I joined. And then from there, I've done six months in Iraq, went back in Cyprus. And then um, it was just basically training. So the first year, it was just basically training with the unit, getting to know the area, um, exercises, um, endless hours on, on the ranges. And then the second year, that's when we uh, deployed to to Afghan. Um, but before that, in two thousand and six, yeah, that's when we went um, on a second um, tour to um, Iraq. But that was, I think, it was a much shorter. I think it was about four months because we got placed on um, reserve. So in case they they required um, a small unit, a company's worth of men, uh, we could easily, you know go over to um to iraq um from there so how had iraq changed between those two, two deployments because i got the sense from the first deployment it was getting um a bit more serious if that's quite the right phrase um and, and i guess things would be different on the on the second deployment um not much and we um we knew what to expect in the sense of the culture um, the language the location although we went to different areas still in basra but it was basically the same, you know, still, you know, working with other units, working on op strikes in a, at nighttime or daytime, working with various um, special force units or with a with a parachute regiment during various uh, raids or assisting with raids, um, uplifting, you know, um, certain personnel of interest. Um, but again, there was quite, again, the same indirect fire with, you know, um, the militia or whoever they are trying to attack us. But, but a lot of it was, I think, done a bit slower, knowing that there were various IEDs, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it was basically just the same, you know. Um, again, anticlimax, no real big contacts for us, you know. So, um, But obviously things changed when I went on my tour to, to Afghan in 2007. But um, yeah, it was very much the same, I would say. You know, from from the first sort of time I went to Iraq, you know, the the first one was an opener was great. Go there, different country, different climate, and that the, the build up to it, it was a good steady build up to it. The training, um, getting the 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 desert uniform, putting it on, you know, um, and then eventually getting on the flights and then getting there. Um, it was a great experience, you know. Um, not many people can actually, uh, you know, say that they've mm. been to. To the area, I know that our um, the Fusiliers um, they were involved during the initial invasion in two thousand and three. You know there was a um, a big sort of date in in the in the Fusiliers in you know, a history calendar, um, but it was very much the same to be honest. Do you think the the fact you were a bit older than everybody else helped helped you and and your your previous experience before joining up? Um, I would say so in certain aspects. Yeah, it definitely helped. And um, like I said, but the thing is, if you go through various um, trauma, um, fear, and all that, um, everyone I think dealt with it in their own different way. Mm -hmm. And um, with the age, I think it helped somewhat. Um, yeah, I would I would say it, it, it helped. Okay, being older. So, how did the deployment to Afghanistan differ? 
Oh, it was full on war fighting. Um, it was crazy. We've done some training for it. Again, um, the tempo was, was quick. Um, before us, another um, company, I think it was Alpha Company, A Company, deployed to Afghan in 2006. Um, and then a bigger, um, bigger sort of, um, well, they're quite more men and um, we deployed um, again back in 2007 to a different area. Like I say, um, they utilized us because we were, you know, quite close to the um, Middle East. We got placed on theater reserve and then whenever required, so they would either put us on 24 hour notice to move, you know, five days notice to move. And so you're back and your Bergen is packed, good to go. So, um, yeah, Alpha Company deployed in 2006. Um, it was quite hot there for them. Yeah, in 2007, it was it was a whole different ball game, whole different ball game. The you know your your engagement rules changed or was a lot different than than Iraq. You know, Iraq you couldn't just you know open up on mm-hmm. on the enemy. There were various sort of rules that that you had to follow to and adhere to. With with Afghan, it was different. You know, the first 20 days that we in in Sangen, it was basically just defending our our compound. You know, we got attacked um, every day, numerous amount of times, all at the same time from different directions: small arms fire, sniper fire, um, RPG, uh, mortar rounds. Um, it was it was on, it was on, it was it was different. Um, we knew that it was going to be hot. Was, um, um, I remember getting ready to deploy because we um, we were going to fly into two different chalks. The first group will fly in Chinooks at night time, fly in and set up, take over from, I think it was the Royal Marines. And then um, the second group will then fly a few days later to two big Chinooks, fly um, across. I was part of the, same, um, of the second group to go across. And then they got postponed because uh, two lads um, got killed um in in the sanga the during guard duty mm-hmm. um i think it was the air burst rpg i think it was and and that got postponed so that um, we you know um stayed in we had to stay on another few days um flying in yeah it was it was full on so does that level of operate how does that level of operations impact you because obviously you've gone from you know iraq to afghanistan there's there's obviously um, a change in the tempo. I mean, even the rules of engagement changing. Does that add cha- its own challenges? Um, yeah, for, for me, it was until many years later that I felt the the effect. Um, because you trained for this, you know, you wanted that. I trained when I joined. It was in two thousand and three. Um, I remember seeing images of the British forces invading or occupying, you know, Iraq. When they're going over there and that was for me that was a big thing and i thought great that's what i want that's me i want to go and be part of that that's why i want to join an infantry battalion be on the ground i don't want to join any other units that's what i want there was a big drive for me there was a big sort of push um we all trained we all knew the the risk you know uh, we all volunteered. We wanted that. That's what we trained for, you know, to close yeah. in with the enemy, to capture or kill, regardless of weather, season or terrain. That's what you want. And that's what we got in 2007, you know, and also for the others that went in 2006. But personally, for me, it wasn't until many years later, you know, when you're not in the units and, you, and you're quiet, you calm down. And I think that's what it hates. Again, it... it it hits, I think, everyone differently. Everyone mm. would experience whatever it is at a different time, and then they would deal with it differently. You know, um, it was, it was. I've always felt I was on edge, on alert. You know, but that's what you train for. You know, you mm. train to, to, to live at, um, at a very quick rate. You get there and get the job done. You know, um, but for me I personally, it wasn't until many years later that I felt like, okay, cool. Um, now I can relax, and and that's where everything comes back. You know, all the memories. Um, um, that yeah, th- that's when I, I noticed. Hang on, something's up. You okay. know, it's it's just. So but you, yeah, that's many years later. Before, before we talk about that, you also when you, you you did seven years in the army, then didn't you go on to do contracting yeah. as well? Is that is that what you said last time we spoke? Yeah, correct. Yeah, so um, 
it was I left in 2010. Um, it was a couple of years from co of um, contract work. But funny enough, ironic thing is, is uh, I decided to leave, not go back to any of that, not touch a weapon system, a pistol or assault rifle, get away from that. And yeah, and then done a, um, a course, got qualified, and then went back to um, Iraq and in Baghdad, Basra, all, all over the place, you know, working for, for various companies, doing various contract work, which I actually loved. You know, it's very much being the same, but just the pay is better. There's still that risk of people trying to, you know, to attack you and shoot you. Um, but for me, it was at the back end of of the peak of doing contract work, um, working with various other other um, personnel. They're all highly trained, um, experienced. They 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 went to Afghan. They've done up, you know, they've got various operational tours under their belt. So we were all singing off the same song sheet. Mm. Um, all working together, it was um, a lot of ex-British uh, forces, um, um, New Zealanders, Australians, South Africans, all ex, ex you know, ex armed forces. So we all had the experience. We all knew what to expect. Um, I loved it. That was amazing. You know, um, done that for a couple of years. But you know, my my wife, um, she felt pregnant. Um, it was likely on my one on my one leave that I could go home and. Uh, we had our first child come back and then uh, we thought that's no, time to stop this you know time to to leave that and then um, I thought okay cool I'll I'll move on and to a more relaxing peaceful family life so where were you living at this point I know obviously you were in Iraq but was your family in New Zealand or were you still in the UK or um, New Zealand, because um, it was in my last year in in the army that I met my my wife. You know, she's a Kiwi. She worked in in London. I met her there. Things got serious, and um, and we decided, okay, cool. I'm going to leave the army, do the course, become qualified, um, and then do the contract work. And she decided, cool. Then she's going to leave the UK, come to New Zealand, and then um, I can do the contract work. And every time I'd leave, you know, the company then would fly out. Um, wherever you live to your home and then whenever time i'd leave come home and spend my three weeks or two weeks in, in new zealand and then and then go back yeah but it was during that stage that she um left the uk and then um came to new zealand okay and the contract work was mostly about reconstruct well, not you personally but helping people or looking after people that were involved in the reconstruction is that right yeah, correct. Yeah, again, a lot of um, money, a lot of time and, and equipment was spent on the reconstruction of Iraq, you know, helping. Um, well, uh, we provided um, security for various clients that, that dealt with the reconstruction of Iraq. Um, for example, the, uh, the building of schools, hospitals, government buildings, um, border roads between um, Iraq and Iran. And, and yeah, basically just helping with the reconstruction of um, Iraq at that stage, you know. Okay, so it's safer work. <laughs> Would I be right in saying that? Well, than... No, um, okay. there is a big risk. No, um, yeah, there was still out there to you know to do you harm. You know, um, I remember I was based in Camp Taji, which is not far from from, from Baghdad, and it was that back end just before the Americans uh, were pulling out, and there were still various American units that got hit with roadside bombs. They killed that you know that they, they got killed. So the risk was still there but mm. it was predominantly the roadside bombs and 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 the odd uh mortar rounds that tried to hit the hit the camps but it was definitely there the roadside bombs before that i would say in the height of the contract work maybe 2006 2007 yeah um, a lot of lads got into various contacts you know um, but then again yeah the money was much more but then the risk was so much greater right okay so you're about to have a baby and um, I guess you're being told that it's time to <laughs> to quit this kind of kinetic stuff. Yeah, correct. Um, and then I thought, okay, quit. it's time to to move on. And yeah, and I came to um, New Zealand. You know, and the first six months it was it was a struggle to find a job. You know, to to settle down. But uh, eventually, I got one, and I was in um, working for a security firm to provide security at a hospital, basically man guard looking after uh, the buildings, uh, making sure that, um, uh, there's security and safety for um, for the staff members, for patients, for visitors. You know, did that. I was for two years and I hated every day. Um, I wasn't happy with that. 
and then um, decided to leave that, and then um, and then after that, I got a job working for a company um, running uh, service academy programs in in local high schools. Uh, basically, where they we got there's five of us doing the same role, and we got all put in different high schools, running various service academy programs for um, for students. So, what are these uh, programs? Explain because not everyone's going to know what I certainly don't know what it what it entails. What's what's the programs? Um, the programs is basically um, it's it's called service academy. And it's it's working with a lot of at risk youth, um, students with um, from broken home life, um, kids, young kids that's been exposed to, to to violence, to gangs, drugs, alcohol, that type of thing, and also a small minority of kids that want to use that as a pathway to get into the armed forces. Now these are all your high school kids, you know, ages from uh, uh, fourteen, fifteen, all the way to age eighteen, you know, and they can use that as a pathway to get into, say, the fire brigade, police, nursing. Any, anyone in, in uniform or just kids that want to just experience a bit of discipline, a bit of routine, and they can utilize that. I say they will um, attend their class a couple of times a week. And yeah, so I, I work with uh, with these kids uh, for the best part of um, seven years um, working for that particular company. Um, never thought I would, I would teach or work with high school students. Um, but I loved it, and I'm still doing it. Although I'm now working uh, for um, a different, um, well, I'm now working for a, a local high school, and I'm doing um, an extra role as well. I'm working with, with with some kids just to um, help with their pathway, leaving school into a, a career. So I'm still running the service academy program, but only once uh, once a week, and then the other times working with students in school and help them. Um, to pave the way for for their career after high school. Mm. So I mean, there's a lot of talk, certainly in the UK, about transitioning from being in the armed forces to civvy street, um, especially given all the recent conflicts, which obviously we're talking about now, um, and the challenges yeah. that might bring. How would you describe your transition? You know, was that a, you know, obviously you spent two years doing a job you hated, I think you just said. So I, I wouldn't describe that as necessarily a smooth transition, but you obviously tell me otherwise. Mm -hmm. I would say the transition from leaving um, the armed forces into contract life, it was smooth. Yeah. It was, there was no real big difference. You know, I was doing the same thing. It, it was easy. I loved it. And leaving that, getting into civilian sector, yeah, it was just the um, trying to get a job. And because in New Zealand, it's, there's not a big demand for security personnel. You know, it's a small country with, I think, about four and a half million people. It's a tiny, tiny, you know, area. And um, just trying to, to get something, it, it, it was a struggle. But mentally, health-wise, I was fine, you know. It, it wasn't until many years later than, you know, then it hit me, um, trying to deal with certain things that I, that I thought I was good at, you know, when I had my, my kids and I've got the family, that's where things started to go sour. When I struggled with mental health, when it finally hit me, I always thought it, it was going to be, or it would happen maybe after a tour, but it wasn't until many years later. I always knew, I knew it was coming. I knew it was, it was going to happen where I'm going to struggle with, with something, you know, um, but I was very much in denial thinking, no, that's not PTSD or PTS. You know, it's not me. It's, it's, I'm grumpy because of something else, or I've got anxiety of something else. It's not PTSD. Um, but it wasn't until much later that it, that it really, really struck me, but I knew it was, it was going to happen. I just had no idea when. So how did you deal with that? How, I mean, I guess your wife supported you with all this, but what, you know, what, you, you, you've obviously not experienced this before and not, and we, we did talk about this, guys are not great at seeking help, are they? I mean, that's, uh, that's almost a given. So what did you do? Um, for me, um, it was writing. Um, it, it, it happened kind of out the blue and because uh, I came across a, a website um, or Instagram page of these two American uh, veterans that own their own company where they publish um, the written work of, of, of veterans, you know, and, and they had a post on, I think, Instagram um, for 
veterans to submit work um poems that um that ultimately that they're going to pick and then they're going to publish in a book uh, which will be like a um various poetry by different veterans and um i thought well i can do that you know um but there was this instant connection and it was as as if it was a something something connected and i thought i can do that and i wrote a, three poems added up on the laptop and i thought should i submit and i just click send and i thought nothing of it but it was after that that there was this big release i thought there was this connection uh, this so i would get outside my comfort zone yeah and i knew something connected there and i started to write more and um, a lot of stuff that i wrote it was it all started in 2019 um, so not long ago. Yeah. And um, I started to put a lot of it out on social media, but more so on Instagram. And then that's where it started. Um, but I would say it was the writing, the, the big thing, the help, the, the release, be able to put these thoughts and feelings on paper or on my phone, on the laptop, and just get out there. Mm. And um, that definitely helped out of a lot. I think, you know, doing that and then um... – sharing that you know on social media or even trying to get it published is did that make you feel a bit vulnerable because obviously you're probably talking about things that are quite quite important to you or quite sensitive to you oh definitely you know um i'm a very quiet person shy introvert so it's not something that i would normally do at all you know um yes i would have my social media put, put a few things up but um i don't really talk about my service i don't share almost anything about my service with my wife you know yes um she knows that i deployed to iraq and afghan but exactly that what it um all the details i don't talk about it. i don't share anything with her i don't share anything with my kids but they're, but they're just too young um i don't really talk about it so putting it on paper and for the world to see mm -hmm. to scrutinize to dissect and and look at and ask questions. Yeah, it's it's way outside my comfort zone, but I never thought of that. That wasn't the 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 thought process. You know, what I experienced in Iraq and on the two tours, Northern Ireland and, and Afghan, um being, being able to put it on paper and get that release. Um, it was just uh, it, it felt comfortable. It felt, you know, this is um it's, it's amazing you know it's it's like talking to a therapist which i've done once and like i said it's not something that we talk about you know especially after our first tour in iraq and second tour in iraq and even afghan you know no one really would talk about it and there was there wasn't a transition okay you've just experienced trauma experienced war you got shot at we've lost men let's talk about it you know that wasn't the case you know we would rather go into the block and drink mm -hmm. you know that, that was the thing back then you know it's not something that us as grown men, you know, we infantry troops, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about your feelings. We don't talk about war. We go drink and we close in with the enemy, capture, kill, you know. So uh, for me to put it on paper and put it out there to be vulnerable is, is, is something I never thought I would do. All power to you. Well done. Um, what is it about poetry? Because this is not uncommon, is it, that, you know, people that have served... Um, I mean, some of the most famous poets are, you know, from the First World War, as I'm sure you know, and they've expressed their thoughts and feelings about how, what war is like, or the consequences of war, or what people have seen, or whatever it may be, an aspect of conflict. What What do you think it is about poetry particularly? Because it's not like writing a memoir, that's something really different, isn't it? It is. I, I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure if it's the the rhyming of the words, because a lot of my stuff is is free flow. There's, there's, they don't really rhyme. Um, for me, it's difficult to say. Um, I just there's this big connection. There's it, it for me. It it feels it's easier than having to put down about me. You know where I was from. You know um, my my upbringing. You know like a, in in a form of a memoir or, or autobiography. I think for me, it's it's that's outside my comfort zone. Um, that's difficult. But being able to put you know, words and thoughts and feelings on paper in poetry form, for me, it feels easier. It feels natural to be able to, to put something down. And because I remember, because I kept a journal in, in Afghan, and I remember 
um, sometime later during the tour, um, I would experience these beautiful sunsets. You know, you, you're in the Sangha, in this watchtower, you know, you've got all the gear on, you know, and and there's the, uh, we had those, we had those moments of, it's it just peaceful. You see these beautiful sunsets, you know, in this beautiful country with mountains. It just, it's, it's a beautiful area, despite the fact that we had the Taliban trying to kill you. Mm -hmm. And I remember those moments and I've put that on paper. It just, it felt natural. I, it's, it's hard to explain. And, and, and all, I also had um, the, the, the influence of, you know, your first and second world war veterans that they wrote, you know, in the trenches, you know, and, and, and I've read some of their work. And I think that, that for me, that was um, a connection as well. There was a big influence for, from their work and, and their work and their words. Um, yeah. So I'm listening, I'm halfway through an audio book, which is all about creativity and it's written by an American author. And she's mm. interviewing and talking to various people involved in the creative world. And she's interviewing a poet, I assume an American poet, not that that matters. And the poet talks about poetry. And the, I don't know if it's a man or a woman, I can't remember, but says that you don't write a poem, you catch a poem. So it sort of passes mm. through you. And it gives you that moment when the poem's passing through, you can catch it and get it down on paper. It's like the way you were talking about it, it's like you didn't even write it. It was almost a feeling, which is kind of what you're saying. And it, that's what I'm hearing anyway. And if it passes through you, you sometimes try and grab its tail. And yeah. but it's too late. You know, you might just get the last line or something like that. I don't know. But I thought that was, and I'm no poet myself, but I thought that was such a beautiful description. Do you recognize that? I would say so. I would say so. I would say it flows through me. I mean, at times um, I feel it difficult, it, it, frustrating to, to get anything on paper. And there's other times where there would be a trigger, where there'd be um, something I've I've seen, something uh, or a music. A music was, was a big, um, big help, you know, um, for writing. But then something might occur and then it just free flows. It just flows. Yeah. I don't know where it comes from. Um, but then I, I've got all these lines on paper. Um, but then other times I struggle to get anything on paper, but I would say definitely this connection with that, there's a, where it's, it's flowing, something happens, something occurs yeah. in the process, but there's certain triggers, something will trigger that. Um, and, um, I might be in the shop and then or they, there's this, a, a word or a couple of words, and then that triggers a memory that triggers a feeling. And then I have to quickly get a couple of words on my phone, get my phone up, put those few words in. And I get home, and then I would then write something uh, because of that trigger. But it's definitely, yeah, it's 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 free flowing, definitely. So, what have people said who've read your poetry? Um, I don't know. Um, I try not to read some of the comments. Um, a lot of good comments. Um, but again, it's it's the introvert, the the shy person in me jumping out. They think, oh no, how can they? I I, I don't want to listen. Um. Then I get all shy and, and 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 all, I you know I get back into my in my comfort zone. Yeah, and I and I and I can't believe that what they say or they might say good things. You know, or um, it's 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 difficult to explain. You know, I kind of like I like that about you. <laughs> I think that's that's <laughs> kind of really honest. I like that. But you know what I mean? I think there's honesty there yeah. in the way you're talking about it, and it's. It, it's like the process, isn't it? It's about getting it out there. And in some ways, it doesn't necessarily yeah. matter what people, because that's not why you're doing it. You're you're not doing it to be an influencer or something, you know, petty like that, I guess. Oh, no, exactly. I'm doing it for, for myself. You know, yeah. like I said, there was instant connection to when I started writing in 2019. Um, I did, I, I, you know, it's for myself. I'm still doing it for myself, you know, and, and um, some of the work that's published, you know, um, my my kids, my son, one day when he's older, then they they can read that, you know, and um, um, they can go through it, and it's something for them. Um, but ultimately, it's for myself. It's a release. Um, I feel comfortable doing that. There's a, there's a massive connection to to the written word um, for me. Mm. So, given that you've you've mentioned a few times that you are quite shy and introverted, and when I sent you an email. And saying, would you mind reading <laughs> one of your poems? We've not really talked about this in massive detail. Um, I'm just hoping that you might still be up for reading one of your poems. Sure. Um, I've got one here. It's called These Eyes. My tired eyes 
hiding my cries, my dreadful disguise, hiding behind these eyes. I despise my dustful cries, my tired eyes. My life flickers and dies, giving in late to my demise. No more sun in my eyes, my last sang and sunrise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very poignant, given everything you've just spoken about. Um, and all power to you for doing that. Thank you. Okay, well, it's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you again. Um, I will find that book that talks about capturing poems because I think it's such a, a beautiful metaphor. And then I'll send you the link so you can have a look at it and decide if you if you want to read it. Um, but again, thank yeah, you very good. much. Because obviously, it's pretty quite a big deal for you to share this, and I really do appreciate it. No, thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for reaching out. Um, I do appreciate that so, so very much. Um, yeah, thank, thank you. Now, before Steve and Tip chat about what we've just heard, you may be interested to know that here at Company of Makers, we've got loads of online activities for veterans to get involved in. As well as this podcast, we've got online talks with inspiring guests. And we've got workshops where you can have a go at things like drawing, writing and photography. To register your interest, just head over to companyofmakers.com forward slash workshops. Now, back to Stephen Tip. Well, another fascinating guest there, Tip. I was um, quite taken aback about, um, well, he's a you know a common member of the Commonwealth, South African, served in the British Army, now in New Zealand. Um, I don't think I was expecting that necessarily. No, for me, it, it's 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 a matter of fact. It's it's a wonderful fact that a lot of our armed forces are made up of uh, people from the Commonwealth. I personally have served with uh, people from New Zealand, Australia, the Caribbean, Fiji, uh, Canada. Uh, so we have to understand that we have will always have that, and they are a very very important part of of what we deliver as as a, as a the United Kingdom which again is attractive because the fact is we're standing here and the things we do and the professional output that we do is for the armed forces is supporting a free, a free speaking, free culture where we have freedoms and we have decisions and we've got an open press. And that is very, very valuable. And mm. really, if you look at it around the world, there's a lot of, lot of nations, quite powerful nations where, where that is, well, negligible. And they don't have that. So to fight to protect that is fundamental. And I think these people that come from the Commonwealth, they fully understand that. Mm. I mean, we only have to talk about the Ukraine to, as a good case in point, don't we? Where, you know, fighting for people's well, land in this particular instance and freedoms is, is really important. Well, for me, for me, what happened or what is happening in Ukraine is something that I would never have expected five years ago, which again, when you look at it, we should have should have expected it. But after the operational experiences in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan, the thought of coming to blows potentially, uh, you know, against another European country, I just thought after Second World War and the stage of, of you know, of global history where we, we are, this could never happen again. And how wrong can we be? You know I mean, there's there's people that really want the liberty that we have for themselves and their own national identity. Mm. And it's, you know, it's it was stopped by, you know, by Russia turning right into Ukraine. And there's people day in, day out fighting for their lives and fighting for what they believe is their freedoms, which is is quite scary in this day and age, but that is what we fight for. And that's why we have to support the U Ukrainian people, I feel, personally. I would agree. Although you wouldn't want me fighting because I'd be about as much use as a chocolate fire guard, to be honest. I fully concur with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I've, I've, well, there's a, few, there's a few unrecorded comments that happen, obviously, whilst we're doing this. And I, I feel like you, you're trying to get at me for some reason for a comment I made earlier. What goes around comes around. As I'm learning. Anyway, back to <laughs> Neville and not our banter. Um, he wasn't in the invasion, was he? The initial invasion. He was He was deployed later. I, um, I can't remember which one he said, actually, but he was deployed later in the conflict. No, he did. He, he joined up late, uh, as you said, like 2003, which is again after the main invasion. Uh, but it was just his, at that age, he was mid-20s. So when you join the armed forces, generally 
enlistment wise maybe if you join as an officer it's post graduation if you join uh when you leave school after A levels, or maybe or before A levels, even you could join up when you're 16 in the British Armed Forces. So he probably joined up, and a, a majority of his peers, although it is changing quite a bit with uh, you know the age restrictions in the military, when he joined up, a lot of his sort of like peers were were maybe you know a sizable chunk younger than him. Mm. But he brought probably a lot to it with his life experience, his traveling, where he came from. Uh, he probably brought a lot of experience and that, that little level of maturity, which helped in, in recruit training. But that's, I think, also for him, he made a very, um, to be say, informed decision to become, you know, a British Army soldier. So uh, that can be and is a, a very valuable asset, I'd say, through any sort of recruit training uh, in the armed forces. Yeah, I think he was 26 and he'd certainly said, you know, not all of it was recorded, but he, he'd certainly, you know, he'd had jobs and he'd been obviously travelled from South Africa to the UK. So you're right, he had a lot of life experiences, where, which I think he felt served him well at the time. Yeah, and I think at that, that age, when he passed out of training, he started, you know, flicking into his first tours during a ceasefire tour in Northern Ireland. Uh, but he was able to take on board the fundamentals of his tactical job, his job as a probably a senior soldier, considering his age, uh, doing the, the the drills, the work as a section or a team, and then moving that up and using those skills they learned, uh, mapping that across into Basra. So he was, you know, I think when you're slightly older, you're able to to harness those experiences a lot easier when you when you're slightly younger. I mean, when you're slightly, slightly younger, you're you're doing your apprenticeship, you're learning the skills, but when you're slightly older, you're able to harness them a, a lot more. I feel I feel it. That's a, that's a personal perspective, but I think a lot of people would agree with me. Yeah, I think it's it's, it's interesting, isn't it, how that brings a different dynamic to the to the to the troop? I guess the organisation that he's in. Um, He's also the thing. He's a very interesting character, as Neville, because he's quite shy actually. And so, getting him to talk, you know, and and talk, you know, because obviously he did say in the recording that he didn't, you know, he hadn't really, he doesn't really discuss his experiences with his family, um, and that he finds that, you know, I don't know if he finds it difficult or it's just his just his nature, if you see what I mean. That he's he's a relatively shy chap, but he has found a way to express himself in terms of his his poetry, which kind of. But part of the reason why we wanted him on there to talk onto the podcast to talk about that, but I think I was, he, he published a book and everything. I'm really quite surprised um, the amount of time he's taken, and you know, holding a book in my hand right now, the amount he's written. I mean, his writing is incredible, but it was way, it was his journey to become uh, towards writing the book. And one of the things, like Neville said, was just when he again, he's he, you know, he's he's a mature guy. He's quite focused. When he made his decisions, he he was deciding what he went to do. He was going to do. When he met his partner, again, decisions were made for them because of where she came from, and he followed that journey. But you know, he's he's in a a confident position. He knows he's had experience. He's got life experience. He's got operational experience. He's been exposed to you know life or death scenarios in in Iraq. Mm. So he's moving on from that. And when he what he did, I and mean, there was there was a line he said, or he said, uh, he just missed the camaraderie. So all this thing is, he goes right. I'll cut that off, and I'll move forward. But then he realised, he goes, I was missing those people that I was able to speak to, and he said, what got him out of that was that being able to write things and and start to get down on paper, and that to me is that creative magic, that little bit that he's he's now and he's now got a published book of poems, which are incredible. And I must admit, it's. It's one of those books where you you like where it's written, you like where it's formatted and where it's laid out, and it's his own words, and they're words that come from a, a really good, signed, can we say, credible place that I can empathise massively with. But it's that journey is for me. It probably, I mean, in a way, it's the same thing. I don't think that I was struggling with what I want to do. I was maybe in the same bracket of I wanted to do something different, but I wanted to map across what I believed. I, you know, what at that stage of my life, I could be, shall we say, uh, be good at or be successful, not successful, just, re you know, reasonably or relatively successful at. And to me, it was creative writing. So I initially did creative writing, but then I seen acting. And as a 
Royal Marine or as a, any service person, as you move through the ranks, you obviously have to perform at certain levels in different theatres. All these words are very similar and you rehearse and rehearse and rehearse, same as you do in operations. So for me, the acting, although people might believe it as polar opposites, creativity or the world of the arts to military life, I think one, they're very similar in their functions and the way they work and the way they're actually created. Uh, you know, whether it be an operational effect or whether it be a theatre production or a TV production. But also it's the the stories, that, the life experience you get in the military feeds that creative spirit inside you. And, you know, and you want to do things, you, you but you know how to do things, but you want to tell that story. And a lot of times, rather than articulate it through speech, you can do it through poetry, you can do mm. it through act, you can do it through dance, you can do it through, you know, creating a sculpture, or doing artwork, you know, or make, you know, playing an instrument. There's so many things, but it, 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 for, for veterans, I, I, you know, I, I can't advise or sort of like, you know, urge them enough, just give it a chance. You know, maybe if mm. they want to go that way, you can see for Neville, it worked a treat and I gave him sort of like, you know, therapy wise, it, it just, it helped him so much. It was interesting. It, it, all that's true. It was interesting, wasn't it? Because he said at one point he didn't know really what was wrong with me. It was much with himself, sorry. He didn't really know what was wrong with himself much later after he left the army as well. And I think he also talked at length about um, the job he now does working with young people in New Zealand that, you know, are falling or are at risk of falling foul of the criminal justice system. Um, I don't know if he's got shared experiences with them, but I think there was a real sense that he wanted to make a positive impact upon young people's lives as well i know and i see that completely and even when Neville was chatting everything he said you could see what benefit they will get from his experiences mm. and his journey and he can completely empathize with them and support them and this is it's quite bizarre because i have at least i'd say five personal friends that i've operated with in the environment i worked in who do a very similar thing now. So I can see that that mentoring, which I can imagine it could be counseling, but it's mentoring. It's just that, you know, helping them, not helping them through that journey, especially in those years, especially when they've been subject to some sort of like domestic or, you know, domestic trauma for, for it doesn't need to be, you know, a veteran community or young veterans, that mentorship or somebody who's been through a, like a journey and can give a, I mean, it's a, it's a classic, again, you know, it can give positivity to their journey and give them maybe a goal or a focus. Mm. You know, it doesn't, doesn't take ownership off them, but it gives them that. And I always put it back to in the old days, your parents or people that were, you know, in that position used to give you this advice, but really you didn't, I never used to, to me, you were, you were, it's always your, your, your way that, you know, you just, just cracked on with it. That was it, mm. you know, and really, you know, but now you look back, and in hindsight, all those little sort of like words of wisdom you got from parents or people that you do respect, and I still respect, they were really valuable. And I think if you're in a position where you're able to open and chat to somebody that can mentor you, you know, in a positive way, uh, and they are, shall we say, credible, as in Neville's case, very credible, I think that will help any young person out, whether they have been, whether they are vulnerable, or whether they're not. They just want, like, you know, a bit of wise words for the for the pathway of their life yeah and I, but i think you know having served and probably lived a bit of a life he's it, that gives him a credibility with kids that think potentially that you know adults are not not necessarily all they're cracked up to be if you know what i mean depending on their own individual experiences you've got someone with some lived experience there who's done and dealt with some pretty tough things I, i'm not you know i don't know what his childhood was like but I, i'm you know i'm sure there's some lived experience there that helps with his credibility with young people so that's got to be a good thing isn't it yeah, I thought you were going to get get mega down and dirty with the words there and be mega cool and trendy, like you know, like a youngins. But obviously, yeah, yeah. Even though I am Peter Pan, I haven't got the lingo weight off yet. You you can say you're Peter Pan when it's audio only. <laughs> yeah. I, I am Peter Pan. Yeah, yeah, fair one. <laughs> that sounded more like Pluto. Anyway, but we digress. I, I can do Pluto. I am an actor, you know. Yeah. Okay. That's for later. That's a different podcast. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so coming back, coming back to um, Neville's book, which he's just published, which is available on Amazon, and we will put a link in the description for those of you who want to have a look. It's called Sangin, so it's um, inspired by his time in Afghanistan. But I think 
the experiences of Iraq and Afghanistan are what led to this book. I don't think it was just about Af- um, Afghan. And it's published by um, a collective of US uh, veterans called Dead Reckoning Collective. And I can't recommend this book enough. And I think what I'm intrigued about as well is how poetry seems to be so such a powerful medium for those that have served. I mean, there's quite a long history of this if you go back to World War I and all the famous World War I poets, but there are many um, ex-service people who are expressing themselves through poetry, and I guess I'm quite surprised by that. I mean, for me, it's it's not only... It, poetry is. I mean, I, I, I do get it, and I... I and again, I have a plethora of friends who who they that is one of their avenues that they follow. You know what I mean? They they want to, they, they do create, they write. But there's also a lot of people now that are writing plays or TV scripts or even stories and fictional accounts and creating characters. And I can you know I can see the attraction. I can see the attraction. And and again, I'm writing as well myself. But it's it's still not at that. I'm not published and I'm not part of that. But it's just I can see the attraction. I just got to get over my procrastination, but it's that it, the, the satisfaction that these people must have when their work is published is incredible. Mm. But for a lot of the people that I know, it's just getting the words on paper. It's being able to write things down and creating something which it's not creating a legacy. It's just creating, it's putting their feeling and how they feel and what's in their mind. And it's written in words and it's, I think it's it can be quite empowering for a lot of people. It's getting it out of your head, isn't it? Yeah, getting your head and and again, it, in your own in your own sort of like bed space, as we would say, it you can obviously you have it and you but you can share it if you want to, and that is giving you a little bit of yourself away when you do that. Remember, because it's you, it's your thoughts and those feelings. Some of them are positive, but some of them, you know, and in a lot of cases, may be negative. But the fact is, it's once you've You've done that. I think you've you've purged yourself of a bit of you, but it also it, you own it and you can share it if need be. So I can definitely see the not just the benefits, but I can see the the attraction as well. Yeah, it's empowering, isn't it? The idea of creating something, especially when it's something physical as well. You know, something tangible that people can can hold, like a book. Um, yeah, I think it's just it's difficult to. Uh, overestimate how big an impact that can have on people oh definitely definitely but it's, it's also the uh people from you know that have maybe been through similar experiences can read his poems and there are di- different words or feelings or thoughts that they will completely empathize with and i think they you know and maybe even empower them to to do do a similar thing mm. Yeah, we definitely encourage that. So we run poetry workshops, like a seamless link, isn't it? And hopefully Neville's going to be coming on that. Our poetry workshops are hosted hosted by Jack Horner, who um, stage name is Lee on the Pig Farmer, which one day you will meet as well. It's <laughs> a great yeah, stage yeah, name. He is, he is um, awesome as well. Yeah, he is good. Um, so we'll be running those as well. So it'd be good to see if, if Neville comes along. I'm sure he will. He said he would. Just got to worry about the 12-hour time delay or whatever it is between here yeah, and New yeah. Zealand. The other side of the universe. The other plant. side of the universe, exactly. <laughs> so I think what we're saying here is, is that the kind of exploring your creativity. I mean, when we when we run workshops, I have to say, if I had a penny for every time someone who served in the armed forces says I don't have a creative bone in my body, I'd be I'd be a millionaire, as uh, Rodders, as they say. But I think, you know, the armed forces, people who served in the armed forces have creative skills. They're probably just articulated in a different way in terms of problem solving, thinking on your feet. Well, for me, it's, it's, I had a little smile on my face when you said like, you know, uh, oh yeah, and we'll say, oh, I've got a, a single, a single, like, you know, artistic bone in my body. Generally, they're the ones that are probably the most creative, you know, and they're, <laughs> they're probably the ones that spin the best day or tell the best story. And I'm going, there you are, creativity at its best. You know what I mean? So it could be from storytelling and everything else, but definitely always be fearful. Somebody says, I haven't got a creative ounce of my body. You're going, ah, yes, well, <laughs> yes. But, you know, scratch the surface a wee bit and they're probably, you know, you know, they've got they, they, their ownership of probably the, the most creative, like, you know, uh, should we say energy. 
Yeah. So the next time anyone says that to us, be warned. We know you're fibbing. I know. And have a quite little respectable chuckle. <laughs> so thank you very much for that tip. What we'll listen to next to, to close this episode is that I managed to get Neville to read a couple of his poems. So if, if we if we just give those a listen and just thank you everybody for listening to, to this episode. Yeah, thank you very much, Neville, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Sang a days, sang a nights. Some days I remember, some days I choose to forget. Other days I can't help but miss. Sang in town, my wonderful world. This one, next one is titled In Search of War. Uh, this boy followed you to no man's land. He dreamt of Ubamba land. This boy followed the spoor left by you. He followed you to war, from boy to man, to war to peace, lost and alone. Fragments of me, of you, I see. This boy followed you to war. Now I stand alone amongst the many. I stand still and they move to and fro, feeling numb amidst the resonant noise. Free falling, I fall amidst the scattering mess. I still dream of you, of war, dreams of Uvamba land, our no man's land, stranded in the wasteland. My old man sitting in the white sand, I followed you to war. This next one is titled Words Less Written. These days, the drums beat a slower, quieter rhythm. Without missing a beat, this book has been altered by time. With black ink blading into new space, words appear, and with time they fade. The room resounds to the sound of my words and covers me in moon dust. The waxing crimson moon gazing down appears to approve of these dark tales. Before you go, if you're a member of the Armed Forces community and need support with your mental health, Op Courage can help. Use the link in this podcast description for details. Or you can phone the Combat Stress Helpline on 0800 138 1619. If you'd like to contact us, email studio at companyofmakers.com. Finally, we're giving a really big shout out to our funders, the Royal Navy and Royal Marines Charity and the Armed Forces Covenant Fund Trust. Thank you. This podcast was produced by Rachel Owen, hosted by Tip Cullen and me, recorded and edited by yours truly. Company of Makers Podcast Talks Workshops 